All right. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at your seminar. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, today, I'll be telling you about the Nielsen realization problem for adult pets of surfaces. Um, and part of the work that I'll be presenting on today is um, joint work in progress with two grad students, uh, Tudor Lewis and Siddhant Raman. Uh, so first, I want to start off by telling you about the Nielsen realization problem in general, um, which I want to state for an arbitrary uh, closed oriented manifold M. Um, for any such manifold M, uh, there's a natural quotient map from the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of M uh, to the uh, pi naught of that same group homeo of M. Um, and this pi naught of homeo of M is what I am going to be denoting by mod of M throughout today's talk. Um, so just to reiterate, this mod of M is always going to denote the topological mapping class group for me. Um, um, and of course, this quotient map just sends a homeomorphism phi to its topological isotopy class, which I am going to denote by this bracket B. Um, and with the setup, the Nielsen realization problem asks the following. Uh, if we have any finite subgroup G of, or at least this is the version of the Nielsen realization problem I want to consider today. Um, if we have any finite subgroup G of this topological mapping class group of M, um, does there exist a section of this quotient map, which I'm going to denote by S, uh, restricted to this finite subgroup G. So in particular, a section G to homeo of M such that the following diagram commutes. We have the inclusion of G into the mapping class group, and then which also has this quotient map from homeo, and I just want this diagram to commute. Um, before I move on, let me point out that uh, if G was actually a cyclic finite group, so if G was generated by some element F, and this was a copy of C mod MZ, then we are really asking, does there exist um, a homeomorphism B? of order M such that this homeomorphism actually realizes uh, a generator of this finite cyclic group. Um, and for the rest of the talk, I will be focusing mostly on the case of this problem where the group G is finite cyclic. So really we're just looking for representatives of a given order for any class F. Um, uh, if our manifold M actually happens to admit more structure than just that of a topological manifold, then um, we can consider some variance of the Nielsen realization problem per the structure that the manifold admits. Um, so for example, if our manifold was actually smooth, um, then instead of just asking if such a section S exists uh, restricted to G, I can ask further that the image of this section actually lands in the diffeomorphism group of the manifold, um, which of course sits inside the homeomorphism group, um, maybe for some fixed smooth structure of the manifold. Um, if instead M also comes, or if M at also admits a complex structure, then we could ask that the image of this section land in the automorphism group of uh, M comma J for some complex structure J.
Um, and finally, we could ask a metric version of this uh, Nielsen realization problem where uh, we could ask that the section um, land in the isometry group of some metric G. Um, but in this case, we don't want to just consider any metric G. So usually we only consider this version of the problem if there's some distinguished class of metrics G on our manifold that people are interested in. Uh, Can I, can I ask a quick question just about the setup here? Um, yes. So if you were, say you were looking at the smooth case, and so I'm sorry, I came in late. Mod M, I assume it's a mod isotopy, right? That's that's what you mean? Yes, I- But, um... but, but for instance, if you were looking at diff M or diff plus, say, um, uh -huh. then the isotopy relation is, as we know, um, different from the isotopy relation. So would you be looking at the sort of, I mean, so the way you phrase it is, you know, you have G going to uh, mod M, which is, you know, homeomorphisms uh, mod isotopy. But would you, for one, you know, for the different categories, would you replace the modular group by the, like the modular group of that category? In other words, you would res res constrain your isometry, your your isotopies. Uh -huh. um, for uh, my work, I don't want to do that. I just want to take a finite subgroup of the topological mapping class group and then just see where I can lift that to regardless of, uh, without changing the isotopy relation per category. Um, but that's certainly something that one could do. It's just not- I mean, maybe, maybe it doesn't make any, maybe it doesn't actually make any difference just because topological isotopy is the weakest of those. So if it's an um, injection, it's an injection, then then, then you're fine. So it, maybe, maybe it doesn't actually matter, but I just just wanted to clear it for myself. Uh, anyway, thanks. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so continuing on, um, I wanted to give at least state um, Kirchhoff's uh, resolution of the Nielsen realization problem in the case of surfaces, um, which he proved in 1983. Um, and this says that uh, if you have a finite subgroup G of the mapping class group of a genus G surface where G is at least two, um, then he showed that there exists a section from G to homeo, or in fact, um, oh, okay, homeo. So that well, the image of the section lands in the diffeomorphism group. Um, and the image of the section can be made to preserve some complex structure and a hyperbolic metric on the manifold. Um, so in this case, the distinguished class of metrics would be the set of hyperbolic metrics, for example. Um, okay, so, so that's the classical Nielsen realization problem in the case of surfaces. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about what's known in the case of real dimension four manifolds. Um, and the first theorem I wanna start out with is the theorem of Far Blue and Ha, uh, which they posted on the archive in 2021, um, where they studied the case of K3 surfaces in particular. Um, and one of the cases that they consider in their paper are just of uh, topological mapping classes of order two. And then they, um, wanted to resolve um, like all three variants of the Nielsen realization problem, at least restricted to this um, order two case. Um, and they were able to show that, uh, that these Nielsen realization problems have an equivalent answer. So more specifically, uh, F is realized 
by a diffeomorphism of order two. If and only if F is realized by an order two automorphism B of some Ricci flat Kähler structure. Where here the distinguished class of metrics that they consider are the that of Ricci flat metrics on K resources. Um, and so the thing I want to point out again is, I mean, this if and only if is saying that the smooth Nielsen realization problem and then the metric and complex Nielsen realization problems all have equivalent answers. Um, and as an example of an order two uh, mapping class, which is not realized by a diffeomorphism of order two, uh, they consider Dane twists about uh, two spheres inside the four manifold, um, which just to recall, exist whenever we have a smoothly embedded plus or minus two sphere inside our manifold M. And this is going to yield a diffeomorphism, which I'm going to denote by T sub S of the ambient four manifold, um, where T sub S has support in some normal neighborhood of S. Um, and it's known that the square of T sub S is in fact smoothly isotopic to the identity. Um, and uh, their theorem applied to this case shows that while well, keeping M to be a K3 surface um, and S to be a negative two sphere, um, then the topological mapping class T sub S uh, is not realized by any even finite order diffeomorphism. Okay, yeah, so that's an example. Um, and since the work of Bar Bluyanha, there have also been um, many other papers that have come out studying uh, non-realizability phenomena for order two elements of the either the topological or the smooth mapping class groups. So for example, Kana approved in 2022, um, a generalization of the Dane twist result of uh, Bar Bluyanha, um, where he considered M to be any closed oriented smooth Spin four manifold uh, with non zero signature, I believe. And any smoothly embedded uh, plus or minus two sphere. Um, then he showed that uh, the same result holds. Um, the Dane twist is not realized again by any finite order diffeomorphism. Um, so just to reiterate this, this theorem encompasses the case of K3s from before. Um, and also following Kano's work, there have also been um, case studies of many non-spin uh, four manifolds. Uh, so many, there have been many other, or many other examples of order two elements uh, of A lot of them, uh, or even the smooth 
mapping class group of M um, that are not realized. in non-spin manifolds, um, such as um, there was this paper of Arabaji and Biker in 23. Um, and there was also a paper of Ono Miyazawa Taniguchi, also in 23, um, where they both consider like uh, like an infinite uh, number of manifolds, uh, which are all non spin, which don't, uh, which admit non realizable order to mapping classes. Um, okay. So with that survey of what's known, uh, I want to now start telling you about the manifolds that I want to consider in today's talk, um, which are this family of complex surfaces called Dolpenzo surfaces. Um, and the algebraic geometers give this, uh, or have a definition for these, which uh, involve like the ampleness of the anti-canonical divisor, um, but for the sake of our talk today, I want to consider an equivalent definition, which is just that a Dolpenzo surface is one of the following complex surfaces, where one choice that we have is a copy of CP1 cross CP1. Um, or I want to blow up CP2 um, at some set of points, capital P, where the set of points I want to blow up uh, are consist of anywhere between zero to eight points. And I want them to lie in general position. Where general position here means no three uh, points lie on a line, no six lie on a conic, and no eight lie on a singular cubic so that one of the points is a singularity. Um, the specifics of what general position means isn't going to matter so much. Um, but the thing that does matter, just to make sure that I have this down, um, is that this latter family of blowups uh, yields a diffeomorphism uh, by blow up some set of endpoints then this is at least smoothly the same as taking CP2 and uh, connected summing a copy of CP2 bar whenever I blow up a point. Um, and I want to give this uh, smooth manifold a name. This I am going to call M sub N throughout the rest of today's talk. Uh, okay. So now that we have some understanding of the manifold in question, um, I want to give a short discussion of the group in question, which is the topological mapping class group, um, denoted by mod of m sub n. Um, and fortunately, uh, there's, you know, if you cite the work of Friedman, Perron, Quinn, Krokenhabiger, and uh, maybe some others, um, they say that if you consider the natural group homomorphism from the topological mapping class group of MN to the automorphism group of second homology of this manifold, preserving the intersection form, um, which of course you just take a class of a homeomorphism and then send it to the automorphism that it induces, um, then in fact, this map is an isomorphism of groups, um, which is very different from the case of surfaces, for example, where the analogous map is known to be surjective, but has a very large kernel um, example. Um, and in the case of 
these manifolds Mn, uh, oops, this group on the right-hand side is very well understood and it has a name. Um, this turns out to be the indefinite orthogonal group with integral coefficients um, of signature one comma n. And I'm going to denote that by O of one n of z throughout the talk. Um, so it's just some group of integral matrices. Um, and fortunately for us, like if we restrict the number of points that we blow up to be small, then um, a theorem of Wall applies to show that the diffeomorphism group does surject onto the topological mapping class group. Um, so if I have a topological mapping class group or an automorphism of homology, I can always find a diffeomorphism to represent it if I want. Um, and I think this is like one reason why one might want to consider n small, because just as a remark, work of Friedman and Morgan um, in the 80s shows that, in fact, if you consider the analogous map for n greater than or equal to 10, um, the image uh, has infinite index in the topological mapping class group. Um, which is unfortunate. Uh, and before we move on from thinking about this group, um, I wanna point out a nice property that this indefinite orthogonal group has, which is um, it admits an index two subgroup, which I'm going to denote by O plus one N of Z. Um, which happens to be a Coxeter group acting isometrically on n-dimensional hyperbolic space. Um, at least if n is less than or equal to 13, which our cases certainly satisfy. Um, and just to say a few words about why this might be, why this is true, um, if we look at this O one n of z, and take like the same set of conditions to find the matrices and consider real values matrices instead, we have an inclusion of this integral group into the real group. Um, and this uh, group of real matrices happens to have sitting inside of it an index two subgroup, um, O plus one N of R, which is exactly the isometry group of n-dimensional hyperbolic space. And so our uh, mapping class group also has this index two subgroup acting isometrically on hyperbolic space. Um, and we'll come back to this idea um, towards the end of the talk again. Um, so for the next little bit, I wanna give you some examples of finite order diffeomorphisms and mapping classes um, before uh, moving on to uh, the statement of the results. Um, and hopefully I can give you some interesting ones which are um, not uh, dame twists, which we already saw earlier. Um, so the first one I wanna talk about is called the geyser involution. This is a classical construction, I think from the 1800s, um, where I am going to take uh, a set of seven points, P1 through P7, in general position sitting inside of CP2, which I've depicted on the left here by the circle with the points sitting inside of it. Um, and I'm going to describe for you uh, gamma, which is some automorphism of the blow up of these seven points by taking um, some point, little q, uh, sitting inside of CP2 minus the seven points uh, in general position with P and describing where that point little q is going to be sent by gamma. So in this cartoon, here's little q. Um, and if I have eight points in general position in CP2, 
um, which I do by just taking the union of P and this little Q, um, then such a, a set of eight points happens to determine a pencil of cubic curves sitting inside of CP2. Um, meaning like uh, I can look at the set of all cubic curves which simultaneously pass through these eight points. So a cartoon of one of them might be this one. And then another one might look something like this. Um, and by Bayes' theorem, when we have uh, two cubic curves, generically, they're going to intersect in three times three, so nine points inside of CP2. So in this cartoon, here is a ninth point at which these intersect. Um, and actually, by uh, for, further by Haley Bacharach, um, we actually we even know that any cubic that passes through the original set of eight points uh, turns out to also have to pass through this common ninth point capital Q. So um, this gamma is going to send little Q to this capital Q, which is the common point in all the cubics in this pencil. Um, and if you run the construction again, but this time with this capital Q instead of little Q, you'll see that gamma has to send capital Q back to little Q. Um, so in fact, gamma happens to extend to an order to diffeomorphism or automorphism. of the blow up at the seven points used to define this construction, which is has the underlying smooth manifold M7. Um, and you can check that the class of gamma has order two in the mapping class group, just by checking that it doesn't act trivially on homology. Um, and it turns out that this geyser involution wasn't just some random example that I pulled hey, sorry. out of literature. Yes. Uh, Serafina, can, can you say maybe, is, it, is there some simple description of how that does act on homology? Um, yes, actually. Um, the way that it acts on homology is it fixes the canonical, or it fixes the dual of the canonical class. Mm -hmm. And it acts by negation on the perp. Okay, thanks. That class. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so it turns out that this geyser involution uh, comes in some family of um, naturally occurring automorphisms of complex surfaces, um, which arise like if you look at the classification of birational automorphisms of CP2. Um, so here is a theorem that does exactly that. Um, it was first written down by Bertini, I think in the 1800s, um, but it wasn't proven or a proof wasn't really written down until Bale and Bovel did it in the year 2000. Um, and the classification says that every birational involution of CP2 is conjugate in the CR of two, which is the group of birational automorphisms of CP2, to exactly one of three types of involutions. Um, there is one type called a Desjonquier involution. Which exists uh, for every degree greater than or equal to two. Um, there is the geyser involution, which we just saw 
Um, and there is a third involution called the Bertini involution, which can be given a similar description that we gave the Geyser involution, but it's just a little longer, more complicated to say. Um, and the Geyser involution that we saw was defined on the blow up of seven points. Um, and the Bertini involution happens to be defined on the blow up of eight points. And the Dejonki error, you can make them for um, any odd number of points, I believe. Okay. So now I want to consider our manifolds not just as um, like complex surfaces, even though they are, um, but also try to exploit the connected sum structure of these smooth manifolds. Um, <clears throat> and so to do that, I'm going to suppose that there's some Dolpezzo surface M so that I have a diffeomorphism of MN with this uh, supposedly smaller Dolpezzo surface M and some positive number of copies of CP2 bar. Um, and once I have such an identification, um, this induces an isometry on the level of these like homology lattices of uh, the homology of the left-hand side with its intersection form uh, with the homology of M with its intersection form, uh, orthogonal direct sum with the homology of K copies of CP2 bar with the corresponding intersection form. Um, and the idea is going to be that if I have an automorphism of homology on the left-hand side, which actually preserves um, this sort of direct sum decomposition, then I want to view that automorphism as coming from uh, this smaller Dolpezzo surface instead of being native to this larger Dolpezzo surface. Um, so this next definition is trying to capture that, um, which is that if f is in mod of mn, and if it preserves such a direct sum decomposition as above, we say that f is reducible. And otherwise, F is going to be called irreducible. So much for much of the rest of the talk, I am going to want to consider like irreducible mapping classes of finite order. Um, and with all of those examples and definitions in hand, I'm ready to start stating some results. Um, <coughs> So in this first theorem, um, similarly to the results that I surveyed at the top of the talk, um, I wanted to consider uh, classes of order two by themselves. Um, so here we're going to let n lie between one and uh, one and eight, and I'm going to take a class of order two lying in what I've denoted by this uh, plus. All I mean by that is I want to consider the part of this indefinite orthogonal group, which acts isometrically on hyperbolic space. Um, and if this F is irreducible, then it turns out that this F is realized by one of the three birational automorphisms that we saw in that classification, either a dejean Guerre, a Geyser, or Bertini. Um, and with this theorem and this understanding of the irreducible elements of this group, um, we can like bootstrap that to say something about the Nielsen realization problem for all elements of order two in this mapping class group, uh, which is done in this corollary, um, where if we take any Dolpezzo surface M and we have any element of mod of M of order two, um, then, in fact, there exists a diffeomorphism phi of order two realizing that class F. Um, and let me just give like a two line proof sketch of the corollary from the theorem. Um, and um, we'll see a little bit more about 
a related proof sketch of a related theorem to this one later. Um, so to see the corollary, uh, first, given any f, uh, realize it as, uh, maybe I'll call it m prime, uh, as acting on some direct, some decomposition like this, uh, where maybe k could possibly be zero, so that f acts irreducibly on the first summand, and uh, f acts by whatever it does on the second summand. Um, at this point, we hit this um, irreducible piece with the theorem to find some automorphism realizing the f restricted to this first summand, and then uh, we equivariantly connected some the two pieces m prime with k copies of CP two bar, where we also find the diffeomorphism acting on this k copies of CP two bar accordingly to form f acting on our desired null of surface m. Um, so before I move on, I want to make a couple of comments. Um, so here's maybe remark one, um, which is that the theorem shows that um, for irreducible elements of order two, the smooth and complex Nielsen realization problems uh, are equivalent, um, and in particular, they both have positive answers. Um, and secondly, I want to contrast this with the non-realizable uh, theorems that I cited earlier. Um, so these manifolds don't admit any examples of order two elements which are not realized by a diffeomorphism. Um, so moving on from just considering order two elements of the mapping class group um, in joint work in progress with uh, Tudor Lewis and Siddhant Raman, uh, we wanted to consider uh, finite order elements of arbitrary order M, um, but perhaps restricted to the case of irreducibles. Um, and that's what we did in this theorem. Um, we're going to let N lie between three and seven this time and consider uh, irreducible finite order elements F of uh, the part of the mapping class group that acts isometrically on, homolog uh, on hyperbolic space. Excuse me. Um, then we showed that the following variants of the uh, Nielsen realization problem are equivalent to each other. Um, so first, we have a version of the complex uh, Nielsen realization problem, which more specifically we considered uh, complex structures uh, J of M sub N. Um, such that M sub N gets turned into a dull Petzo surface instead of like an arbitrary complex structure on the manifold. Um, and there exists uh, an automorphism of this complex structure of order M realizing the given class F. Um, the smooth Nielsen realization problem uh, in the case of N less than or equal to six, which is just cleanly, there exists a diffeomorphism uh, of Mn of order M realizing class. 
um, we had to add a little condition in the case of n equals seven, which is uh, we have the same as above, but we restrict to the case when the fixed subspace of homology by this class is one dimensional. Um, and we have two more variants, um, the metric and the killer Einstein. Um, I want to mostly focus on the first three variants for the rest of the talk, but just to give you a flavor of what we have here, um, the distinguished class of metrics that we consider is um, Einstein metrics of, uh, uh, of symplectic type. Uh, and of course we take an isometry realizing this class um, and the Kähler-Einstein version, which is just, there exists a Kähler-Einstein pair. Uh, a, an Einstein metric and a complex structure and an automorphism of his structure. Such that this automorphism realizes this class. Um, okay. So this is the theorem that I want to give a quick proof sketch of. Um, you'll see that unfortunately it does involve some enumeration um, and casework at the end, um, but we were able to establish such an equivalence. Um, so in this proof sketch, uh, I want to focus on the direction, which is, um, so if a class is realized by a complex automorphism, oh, oops, then it's clear that that class is also realized by a diffeomorphism of order M. Um, and then so in this proof sketch, I'm going to tell you how to prove um, the converse of that, or basically show that if your class is not realized by a complex automorphism, then I want to show that, in fact, that is also not realized by this weaker thing, by diffeomorphisms. Um, so here's the theorem that I have already mentioned um, by Wall and Vinberg. Uh, which was that in the case of when n is small, our group yields an index two subgroup, which is a Coxeter group acting on n-dimensional hyperbolic space. And more specifically, um, what this means is that this group is generated by finitely many uh, reflections across hyperplanes sitting inside of this n-dimensional hyperbolic space. Um, and so you might have been looking at this little picture on the side, um, and I wanted to show this because it's a nice picture. Um, this is an example of what happens in the case of n equals two, our group O plus one, two of Z uh, is going to act on like the hyperbolic plane because n is two. Um, and it turns out to be isomorphic to the two, four infinity triangle group um, of which I took this picture from the Wikipedia page for triangle groups. And what's going on here is 
um, our group is going to be generated by, you take one of these triangles, um, like this one, and you take the reflections about all of the walls through that triangle um, and like have it act on, oh, sorry, that's not the right one. So it's this wall, this wall, and this wall, and have it act on hyperbolic space by reflections and just look at the group that it generates. Um, and it turns out that this picture shows all of the translates of a fundamental domain um, where a single fundamental domain is just one of the triangles in this picture. Um, okay. So with this structure in hand, we're able to um, say something about uh, like a specific Coxeter subgroup of this larger group. Um, so there is a distinguished uh, finite subgroup, finite Coxeter subgroup called the vial group, which I'm going to denote by W sub n. Um, and another way to characterize this group is just as this group is turns out to be the stabilizer of the canonical class of the uh, dull pezzo surface uh, structure of MN. Um, and using the Coxeter group structure, one can prove um, that this vial group plays an important role regarding irreducible elements, such as um, you can show that there's a, for any irreducible element of the part of the mapping class group acting asymmetrically on hyperbolic space, um, this is going to be conjugate into this finite file group uh, if n is less than or equal to 8. Um, okay. A third ingredient is this giant paper by Dolgachev and Iskovskik uh, in 2009, where they classified uh, the automorphisms of Alpezzo surfaces. Um, and they have like a huge table of all what all the possible automorphisms of these complex surfaces look like. Um, they were really interested in this very related um, idea of classifying minimal rational G surfaces because they were interested in like finite subgroups of the Birational automorphism group of CP2, uh, similarly to this like Bale, Bogle, and Bertini result from earlier. Um, so we have a very good understanding of what uh, things look like on the complex side due to the work of Dolgachev and Iskovskik. Um, this might be a good time to point out that on the metric side, um, similarly, we pull very heavily from the work of Lebrun. Um, and Bando Mabuchi, where they um, studied uh, like symplectic, oh, so, uh, Einstein metrics of symplectic type on these manifolds and so on. But uh, I don't want to say so much more about the metric side beyond that. Um, now, finally, uh, we have this last step of the proof. Uh, which is we have some understanding of uh, the subgroup in which the irreducible elements have to lie up to conjugacy. Um, and we have a very good understanding of the complex automorphisms that can occur. Um, so all that remains is for every irreducible F in the mapping class group, 
which does not appear in the classification of um, the dolgachev uh 2009 paper, um, we can contradict the existence of a diffeomorphism uh, of order um, realizing this class F. Um, and in this step, we use um, some known tools in like the theory of finite group actions on uh, four manifolds. Such as the work of Edmonds um, and maybe the G signature theorem and so on. Um, so that concludes the proof sketch. Um, maybe to show you that this last step um, actually does involve like some cases where we have to rule out the existence of uh, some diffeomorphisms of order M. Um, I wanted to just give some examples of uh, what happened in the case of N equals seven. Um, there, in, in this case, there did exist non-realizable uh, Fs of order uh, six, eight, 10, and 30. Um, and there also were some non-realizable cases that we had to deal with in the case of n equals five. Um, okay. um, so in the last six or so minutes of the talk, I, I wanted to end with some examples of um, like realizable, irreducible classes of these mapping class groups and some non-realizable examples um, of uh, of mapping classes uh, for these Dolpezzo surfaces. Um, and the way that I've organized them is by constraining um, by the orders of these elements, um, kind of like how we constrain to like order two elements at the beginning. Um, so for example, if we want to consider Coxeter numbers, uh, which I will denote by H sub N, um, this is defined to be the order of the Coxeter elements of this finite Coxeter group, the vial group, which we saw in the proof sketch, um, where a Coxeter element is um, an element that you get by taking the standard set of generators of this finite Coxeter group and composing them in whatever order that you'd like. Um, and it turns out that any element you obtain this way is conjugate to each other, making the order of this group um, like an invariant, the order of such elements, uh, an invariant of the Coxeter group itself. Um, so it's some, uh, it's some invariant of the group. Um, in our cases, these numbers turn out to be, uh, so here are all the ends that I'm going to consider. Um, the Coxeter numbers turn out to be 6, 5, 8, 12, 18, and 30. Um, and we show in our paper that Coxeter elements themselves are irreducible. Um, and it was known already that these also are realized by complex automorphisms. Um, and in the case of n equals eight, which was not covered by our theorem, um, we had some examples regarding these Coxeter numbers. Um, so in the case of n equals eight, we showed that there exist exactly two irreducible classes of order equal to the Coxeter number, which is 30, um, up to conjugacy uh, in uh, mod plus of uh, M8. Um, 
One of the classes is the Coxeter element. And of course, this is realized by a complex automorphism, as I claimed was already known. Um, but it turns out that the other conjugacy class is not only not realized by a complex automorphism, but we also checked that it can't be realized by any diffeomorphism of order 30. Um, so that's one example um, in this extension to n equals eight. Um, and the final example I want to I want to look at are irreducible classes of prime orders. Um, and if you follow either like uh, as a corollary of our proof, um, or maybe um, if you look at the Dolgachev and uh classification very carefully, you can deduce that um, if we have an element of the mapping class group of odd prime order P, regardless of irreducibility, then in fact, this element is realized by a complex automorphism of some complex structure on MN, um, turning MN into an iterated blow up of CP2. Um, maybe N is less than or equal to eight here. Um, but I wanted to give an alternate proof, uh, which um, I think is really nice, um, even though you, you don't need this alternate proof. Um, in the case of F being irreducible, then um, we can use mm -hmm. this result of McMullen from 2005 Uh, where he finds a vial group equivariant map from um, some space that's coming to us from homology or cohomology. Uh, so we take the C-span of the canonical class minus some hyperplanes and then map this to the moduli space of marked blowups of CP2. Um, and it turns out that if you just use some linear algebra, we can deduce that if F is irreducible, then F fixes a point in the domain meaning that F also fixes a point in the codomain, and then the fixed point in the codomain corresponds to um, like the complex structure for which an, you get an automorphism realizing F. Um, so I just wanted to point out this proof uh, because this feels um, very close to what um, like other, many other Nielsen realizability proofs look like where you act on some moduli space um, and then you look at a fixed point and then interpret that uh, interpret appropriately. Um, but anyways, that is all I wanted to say. Um, and this is a summary of the two results that I talked about. Um, thank you very much.